we have got lots of questions um, and lots of the faces that you can see here are the speakers that you've um, seen and heard from over the past couple of days but there will be two names that um, you may not be familiar with so instead of going through everyone's names I'm just going to ask Jonathan and Brian can you just give a little intro as to who you are and why you're here really quickly because we do have lots of questions <laughs> so I'm Brian Lawrence I'm the principal investigator for Jasmine Thanks, Brian. and uh, I'm Jonathan Churchill I'm responsible for the physical infrastructure of uh, Jasmine and its, uh, its architecture. Fab. Thanks, Jonathan. Right, I'm going to jump straight in because we have got loads. So we've tried to try, tried to group the questions into kind of categories. So the first category that we're going to cover is more about the organisational role of Jasmine. Um, so the first question is uh, we have a NERC funded grant with partners, two organisations, but probably four people in different parts of the UK that would benefit from access to Jasmine. Can you say something about the shared workspaces and how to apply one? Um, how do you go about setting up an account, applying for use, and is there a cost involved? So Matt Pritchard, this one's probably best for you. Okay, thanks. Um, so there's, there's probably several parts to this really. Um, uh, in the first part, the, in practical terms, um, the place to go to um, make yourself an account is the Jasmine Accounts portal. So that's accounts.jasmine.ac.uk. Um, and uh, you can make yourself an account. You can get, up set, uh, you can get set up with your um, uh, SSH key and apply for the various roles that you need um, to access the resources on Jasmine. Why the question is, um, I think, um, you know, who, who's Jasmine for? Who, who's able to, to use Jasmine? And um, so I kind of prepared a, a little slide which might help with this. Um, so maybe if I can just share my screen and show you that to help in the discussion. Um, do you need to share? <clears throat> so this. Um, sort of sets out how things are organised really um, in the Jasmine user community. So we have a system of uh, what we call consortia. Um, some of them are listed down here, although I've just realised it's slightly out of date. Um, but the idea is there's a consortium manager who represents um, particular areas of um, uh, the science community. And each, each consortium has um, an, an overall allocation of some of the resource types that we need to allocate to projects um, as they come on board on Jasmine. So uh, the different types of uh, disk media, but also um, there's bits in progress actually, uh, allocations for um, the cloud uh, platform as well. So when a new project comes along, um, they would um, first of all talk to their um, relevant consortium manager um, who would uh, be able to advise, first of all, you know, whether their, um, the, the, the funding for their project, whether they're kind of, um, uh, that makes them eligible for, for, um, for using Jasmine. But essentially it's to the, you know, to the NERC environmental science community um, and friends. I think Brian can probably say a bit more about that after me. Um, so they, they would be able to advise and, and also um, sort of tension the different requests, priorities for uh, projects within that particular community. So then a particular um, project PI, um, who sometimes doubles up as, as, as the um, sort of group workspace manager, um, would then be, uh, you know, provided with those resources on Jasmine um, to share among their users. So they'd then be responsible for, um, you know, granting access to, to um, uh, the group workspace, for example, or the cloud tenancy. Um, we've got a ten tenancy admin over here, which is equivalent to the group workspace manager uh, for, a, for a cloud tenancy. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we've got a, a kind of a system of overall allocations to consortia, and then within that, um, allocations to individual projects. Um, uh, but for, yeah, for the, for the sort of practical details of actually how to get online, um, it's the accounts portal. There is a bit more information about um, you know, how to request um, a group workspace, but also that covers generally you know, how, to, how to request that your project 
um, is, is granted um, access to, to Jasmine, and that's here on this health article. Great, thanks Matt. Um, so I think that will lead quite nicely into the next couple of questions, which Brian, I think, probably for you. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase quite a few questions because yeah, we've had similar kind of ones. So um, will the prerequisite for using these services continue to be a NERC funding source? Um, and another kind of similar question is, what do I do if my job is too small for Archer but not a traditional data intensive workload? Um, someone has said Jasmine is not being extended to be a NERC platform for mid-scale par parallelism. Um, so just asking about procurement and kind of the future. Okay, well, um, it's slightly different. So, so first, Jasmine is currently funded for NERC related science. Uh, that isn't necessarily NERC funded, although uh, certainly NERC funded is, is free at point of use. NERC related science may require some contribution of funding depending on what's going on, but, but access should normally be granted. If the resource requirements are large, then the contribution of funding becomes larger. Even if um, it's NERC funded, if the resource requirements are large, that may have a funding implication. Clearly, Jasmine's finite in size. Uh, as, as to the other questions, which are, I think, more related to UKRI's e-infrastructure, which is a phrase you probably haven't heard too much of, um, UKRI is tr that UKRI being the, the consortium of, of research councils, is trying to come up with the way of um, addressing the requirements that we all have for a range of computing in a way that doesn't duplicate activities across the research councils. That, for example, is why we have Archer as a shared activity between uh, NERC and EPSRC, and others actually can get access if they need to, but NERC and EPSRC mainly use Archer. Uh, the future for, for Jasmine-like activities will, will be in a wider UKRI activity. Um, and in that wider UKRI activity is provision for what you might call capacity computing. That is the sorts of jobs that as someone said is too small for Archer and, and perhaps not traditional Jasmine. How we get from where we are today to that future is a moot point and one that's being discussed and, and for obvious reasons, how quickly we get to that future may depend on all sorts of things um, in the next few months and, and years. Um, currently, NERC would recommend that you apply for access with either Archer or Jasmine and let us worry about it if you've got it in the wrong place. Um, but if you've got a NERC project and it has NERC computational requirements, um, then, then we would have a conversation about which of those is best with you directly. Great, thanks Brian. Um, so I think those are our kind of future looking questions. I might have a couple more that I've missed, but I'll move on to storage capabilities now. Um, so Neil and Phil, I think this one's for you. So the question is, what sort of workflows do you think would benefit from using the object store for their storage? So Neil, do you want to maybe talk about tooling first and then hand over to Bill? Yeah, I think um, a workflow that involves, at this current point in time, a workflow that involves NetCDF is like, going to be really advantageous for using the object store because the, the, the tools to read and write NetCDF directly to object store already exist, as I showed in my talk earlier. Um, the kind of workflow that I showed where you retrieve some data from the object store, do an analysis and put it back, you could you could do that, but it's not really using the object store to its best advantage and you, you'd be just as well using elastic tape to do that kind of um, workflow. So Phil, do you want to say a bit more? Yeah, I, th I think um, a major challenge is, uh, historically has been the ability to share data across different parts of Jasmine, um, particularly um, into the cloud environment. And um, what um, some groups have been doing increasingly, we're, we're seeing more and more um, cases of this, is where um, they've got a requirement to share data through their, their cloud um, applications that they've built. 
Um, but they want to be able to produce the data in the first place or do some processing perhaps with Lotus. So um, there's a kind of workflow where the data is uh, processed with Lotus, it's transferred onto the object store and the object store is, is like a way of then sharing the data in the cloud environment. So that, that's one example. And another one is that I'm starting to come across more and more cases where people are coming to us and they're saying, um, we want object store <laughs> as our first, that's, that's our starting point, we want to use object store. So perhaps they've had experience, um, for example, in the EO community using um, cloud optimized geotiffs or something like that, or they're using X-Array and Czar. Um, there's a data cube project, which I mentioned in my talk, which uh, DEFRA J and CC are doing. Um, so I think it has um, a lot of flexibility there. And because it is using HTTP for access, it means that um, potentially you can access it from anywhere. At the moment, the way the access is set up is that um, you can access it between our cloud environment and the rest of Jasmine, but there are plans to make it accessible to the outside as well. So I think it's a really um, convenient um, means of, of making data more widely available because it's, it's using HTTP. Okay, thanks Phil. Um, okay, so I think this next one is probably for you, Jonathan. So the question is, what's small in considering where to hold files? Thanks Poppy, yes, that's a, uh, that's a really good question. Um, uh, it's been coming up a lot more uh, frequently uh, now that we have, uh, have had multiple tiers of storage uh, since our Jasmine 4 round, which was now uh, two years ago. Um, so strictly speaking, what we call a small file is anything less than 64K. However, um, a 64K uh, file, and that includes anything down to a zero sized file, will occupy at least 700 kilobytes. Um, if it's on our soft platform, that's 700 kilobytes split over 11 different servers. So you can imagine if you're trying to pull a one kilobyte file back and you're trying to access 700 kilobytes from 11 different servers over the network, uh, there's a significant overhead. And uh, that's why small files on the, uh, what we call our soft platform, uh, has been a uh, problem. Um, and that's why in Jasmine 4, we introduced uh, our flash tier. Um, so this is the thing that supports our um, SMF uh, volumes, our small file. Um, also supports our home directories and the uh, scratch hyphen no PW uh, directory. Um, and that is specifically for uh, small files and metadata intensive uh, workloads. Um, but it's much more expensive than our soft platform, uh, so you get less of it. So at the minute, small, uh, our SMF volumes uh, will, pre uh, will provision something up to 100 gigabytes of those. And uh, the, on the soft platform, it's anything from one to 200 terabytes. Um, so clearly, um, even with uh, this um, 700 uh, kilobyte limit, um, it, you're not effectively uh, using soft storage uh, for even for 700 kilobytes. And it, it doesn't really become optimal until you're up into the sort of the megabyte range, something around about sort of uh, seven, eight megabytes is what the, the soft vendor recommends. So there is this grey area between 64k and uh, and uh, sorry the um, the small files uh, and small amounts of uh, storage on the Flash platform, which is great for compilation workloads, for example, um, and this kind of megabyte size range. Um, and uh, it, but it's a very good example of the work that we've been doing with the soft uh, vendor in the background um, to uh, to improve and add features. Um, many people probably won't know that the soft vendor that we use is uh, this company called Quobyte. And uh, Quobyte, uh, interestingly, um, one of their other customers is uh, one of the uh, large media streaming platforms, which I can't talk about who it is, um, but it was quite impressive when I found out who it was. But even that large media streaming platform, uh, Jasmine still has the largest capacity uh, Quobyte storage on the planet today. So we're a very big customer and we've done a lot of work with them, uh, both um, for stability and adding new features. One of the new features they've just added is something that we've been asking and working with them to provide for the last year or so, a thing they call mixed file layout. And uh, this is something where we'll be introducing in the next year. We have it working on the platform now for experimental. And this is something where the small files are stored in a replicated manner, which is much more efficient. 
um, and but as the file grows, uh, it grows onto uh, the hard disk tiers. And this is exactly the way that our parallel file system uh, works. It um, puts the small files, less than 64K, onto uh, SSDs, and as the file grows, the rest of the file goes onto uh, hard disks. And uh, so we're expecting that to uh, significantly improve our ability to support people who've got um, a mix of small files and, uh, and large files in their group workspaces. Um, however, to support that requires literally petabytes of flash and SSD um, onto our size of platform. And that's quite a significant expense, um, but we'll be we're looking to procure that as part of this year's um, storage round. Um, but uh, as I say, it is it is a very good example of the sorts of things that the vendors have been doing for us because we are very important to them. And uh, clearly, uh, there have been a, uh, there were some other comments in the questions that we got about um, uh, the improved stability um, for uh, what we call the parallel write problem. And uh, that's uh, that has largely gone away, um, and we've been working on that very hard in the background uh, with uh, with Quobyte to uh, to improve that capability. So uh, sorry, yes, that's a yeah, that's a, a ramble over small versus large files and uh, what's going on in the background. Thanks, Jonathan. I think it's really useful to know the um, kind of context behind these things that are happening. Okay, um, the next set of questions. Uh, kind of surrounded around workflows. Um, so the first one is about software. So Ag, I think this one's for you. It says, we are particularly interested in R and using specific libraries within that. Um, some will compile C libraries on installation. On other platforms, it sometimes takes administrators to get involved. How would this be handled on Jasmine? That's a good question. Um, so we, we have, limited experience within our team in terms of using R. Um, we've only played with it very peripherally, um, but we have been in discussion with parts of the community that use it a lot um, because we would like to improve our support for R. But of course, and all these things come at a cost. But a and there's a limited number of things that we're able to support adequately. Um, so in the short term, we are looking at building an, an R-specific Conda environment. Um, so using the JASPI approach, but only looking to support R and a set of most commonly requested libraries within that. Um, and we've been talking to CEH about doing that. Um, and of course, users can install packages themselves within their own R workspaces. But I think yeah, oh, overall, we're looking for more community engagement um, if we're going to manage to provide significantly better our support. But um, we, are, we are meeting, I think we're meeting next week to talk to CEH further about this. But if anyone has a bit of time and effort um, and interest, then please get in touch with me and, and we can talk about it further. Great. Thanks, Ag. I think there's another um, question, which is probably for you as well. Um, so they're talking about using a, a particular technique of modeling, um, but unfortunately the package providing the functionality cannot be paralyzed. But for simulations we plan, um, that we plan, we would like to start separate instances on a large number of cores. We used a similar strategy on another HPC via the batch script when queuing the job. I wonder whether people do this on Jasmine and whether you might have template scripts. Um, so very quick answer. Do people do this on Jasmine? Yes, they do. So, so um, I mentioned yesterday in my talk on workflows that it, it's very common for people to bring a problem to Jasmine that they then need to scale up and run in parallel across a number of CPUs, to potentially a number of servers. And that's, that's the sort of, main use case for using Lotus. Um, so it makes good sense to separate out large workflows into a set of smaller tasks that, that can be submitted separately and run independently of each other. Um, and you can do this by writing job scripts, which are very simple bash scripts, which just um, provide some directives to the Slurm scheduler and, and then run whatever commands need to be run. But, but you can, you can, and you can use those to wrap R, 
for example, Python, other languages. Um, you could also potentially use job arrays as a way of grouping a set of jobs into a single submission. Um, if, your, uh, if your workflow requires um, multi, a multi-step approach, so if it has dependencies to, between different stages, um, then you could also look at doing that through the Slurm scheduler or using tools like Rose and Silk um, that we have mentioned briefly um, the various parts of our um, talk, but they, they are also linked to our documentation, documentation and our training materials. Great, thanks Ag. Okay, so the next set of questions um, are all about compute and transfer tools, which as you can imagine, we've got lots of questions about that because that's what everyone's doing on Jasmine. Um, so I'm gonna try and pick out kind of the more general higher priority type questions. So. Um, Matt Pritchard, this one I think is probably for you. So it says, is there any plan to have a method of directing a user to a machine with low load directly instead of the user having to check the load prior to logging into a sign machine? Would be helpful when a particular machine is being hammered or is offline. Okay, so um, yeah, we do provide um, a view when you first uh, reach the login machines, the, the sort of message of the day presents a list um, of the available sign machines and you know how many users are currently on that machine, uh, the free memory and the CPU. So um, that's, your, that's your best uh, route to get an idea of how loaded those machines are. Um, it's fair to say that it's, it's not as easy as um, it sounds to then provide an automated um, way to route you directly to the to the to the least loaded sign machine um, we have tried a similar thing before with load balancing um, and it, it wasn't um, very successful so um, at the moment there's no solution for that uh, but the the information there should give you a good guide as to um, uh, the machines that are uh, the, the right ones to use it's probably not a good idea to kind of hard code your favourite um, sign machine as, as a kind of alias, um, it is best to refer to that list and sort of dynamically choose which one you want to go to when you when you, log, when you go via a login machine. Um, I think someone's just added a follow on question, which I'll ask quickly. It's a, um, they say, can the message on the login machines about sign machines usage also be put on the sign machines when logged in? Is that the difficult bit that you can't put it on the sign machines, you have to do it on the log? login machines, right? Um, maybe Jonathan can answer that, I'm not quite sure. Okay. You're on mute, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, sorry, can you repeat this question? Um, so it was just a follow-on question from the one that Matt was talking about, and they said, um, can the message on the login machines about Sci machine usage also be put onto the Sci machines when you're logged in? Um, it could be. Okay. <laughs> there we go then. <laughs> All right. Maybe that's something for was, us to look into. It was just the other point, uh, Matt, wasn't there about the tenancy sign machines as well? So that gives another capability yes, as well, I mean. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier about the problem of load on the, um, the general purpose shared sign machines. So the, the whole kind of tenancy sign machines um, project, if you like, gives, gives another solution to this. Um, yeah. Oh, all right, thank you. Um, so we've had a variety of questions about Slurm functionality and kind of its differences to LSF. Um, so we don't have time to answer all the questions individually because they're all quite specific, but we will try and answer them where we can. But Fatima, did you want to just give a quick um, summary about the differences between Slurm and kind of what we're doing or not doing? Um, yeah, so... Um, we had questions about some features that are not uh, available or difficult to mimic and that needs um, some scripting. Um, but the majority of features that um, in terms of scheduling and um, assigning resources are there. Um, one feature that is, um, uh, I know it's important for some groups, which is the grouping of jobs. Um, 
if those users can come across with some solution, then we're happy to look at it and um, implement it. But we just don't have the time and the um, efforts to uh, find a workaround. Um, there was some um, um, job dependencies in Slurm. Uh, is the referencing to job is by ID number and not by job name. That was one of the features that was missing in Slurm. But there was a workaround and I had contacted the user. I, might, I make sure that workaround is available. But for the job grouping hierarchy is still not available and we don't have we don't have the work around it at the moment. Thank you. Um, okay, so Matt Pritchard, we've got a question about what skill set will be required for managing the tenancy sign machines? Um, and then kind of another follow on question, um, which is asking about the amount of resources that could be asked for and how many people you need to have your own tenancy machine? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. Um, so first of all, you know, sort of what what constitutes a community, if you like. Um, looking at the number of projects we've now got on Jasmine, it's in the region of about two hundred and fifty um, sort of individual science projects. Obviously, we have finite resources, so um, I think it's fair to say that at the moment we've got. Um, too many projects or, or the other way around, you know, insufficient resources to give every project their own tenancy uh, to have a sign machine. Um, a, a, another kind of aggregation you could use would be the, the consortia. We talked about these sort of communities of um, uh, science uh, domains, if you like. We've got about 10 of those. Um, that's possibly too coarsely grained. Um, in a way, possibly the, the, the most important thing is that um, one of each of these groups has um, a person who's willing to be the manager to take on that kind of admin manager role um, and, and so what are the, the skills that they need? Well they need to be able to, um, they need to know their community so they need to be able to talk to their own set of users um, that ideally they have an idea of what sort of workflows those users are um, interested in doing so they can, can sort of help them. Um, th this may um, work out best if it's um, you know, like a scientific IT um, support person within a particular institution or department um, that's possibly the kind of person we're, we're thinking of but um, I think it's fair to say we're in early days of this at the moment we need to decide how we're going to um, roll this out at a bigger scale um, so some of these things are still to be worked on um, but you know if, if you are interested in, in taking on that role uh, and, and you've got a sort of reasonably well-defined um, community that you're willing to do that for then um, please get in touch and we can look at that. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, so I've got a similar question about cluster as a service. So I'm not sure, Matt Pryor or Phil, if you want to answer this one, but it's about, again, setting up and managing the clusters um, and whether the role is best served by the user's base IT department um, or who kind of should manage it and what's the skill set required to manage it. Um, so I can answer this. The, I would say that broadly, for cloud for the use of the external cloud which is where you get where you get root access and you can do the most customizations that's also the place where you can do the most damage if you get stuff wrong so i would say in general we would encourage groups to treat that as an extension of their on-site it provision and that somebody with sysadmin experience should be involved in the administration of that um the same applies for the cluster as a service, really, except that a lot of the configuration, the, the, only, the thing it's doing on top is the configuration of these complex pieces of software. And I wouldn't necessarily expect the person who's managing the cluster as a service clusters to be an expert in Kubernetes or Slurm or Gluster, but I would expect, I would still expect them to have that base level of, of sysadmin skills. Yeah. Right. And another kind of follow on question for cluster as a service and um, they're saying, if I have a cluster as a service, can I give students fourth year undergraduates access? Yes. It's your cluster. It's in the external cloud. The users aren't Jasmine users. You, you can add whichever, whoever you, users you want. The nice. only thing, the only thing to bear in mind is that you, you as the tenancy admin are responsible for their behavior on the system. So if they behave badly, 
doing or use the Jasmine systems to do things like to do bad things like launch DDoS attacks or anything like that. It comes back on you as the tenancy admin. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Um, okay, so I'm not sure who this one's for. Probably Ag. It's about rose and silk to run jewels. Um, so they say, I use rose slash silk to run jewels. Um, rose sweets on jasmine silk. And I think that still uses LSF. Is there any update on when slash how that will move to Slurm? Um, so, yeah, I can give positive information about that. So we, um, as part of migrating all our servers from Red Hat um, Enterprise 6 to CentOS 7, we've had to move um, all our services to new servers. So um, earlier on in the year, we set up a test silk server and then rolled out a production one. It's not fully documented. That's something we're in the process of doing. But the new server is simply called Cedar. Sorry, the new server is simply called silk.jasmine.ac.uk. And it automatically integrates with Slurm. Um, so everything is set up to do that. And there are a number of users that have already migrated onto that and are using it in their, their production workflows. So please, please, where you've previously gone to jasmine-silk.cedar.ac.uk, now just go to silk.jasmine.ac.uk and it should all work for you. Right, thanks, Ad. Um, okay, this one's come in during today. I think it's quite an important one. So I say, <laughs> given that you say object store, is the way things are going. Um, for a lot of the community, this will be a big step change moving to a non-POSIX environment. Do you think Cedar will run training sessions in the future to help users, uh, to help users make this transition? Who wants to tackle that one? Um, I, I can try and start it off. Um, I think it is gonna be really important to um, support the user community. Um, I think we are still learning about it ourselves and um, different patterns, optimum ways to store things and access the data. So um, it's something that's in process, I would say. So I don't think we could say today, you know, we can give a strict set of instructions, do it X, Y, and Z. I mean, we can, we can start to do that, but I think it's going to involve a process over time as it matures solution. Yeah. If I can uh, do a quick chip in as well. Um, uh, one of the ways that we uh, procured object storage was an ability for people to um, interchange between uh, POSIX file and uh, object without having to copy the data around. So although uh, the things we're presenting to users at the minute and which um, Neil and Phil have talked about is, is uh, appears to be a standalone object file, uh, we do have um, object interfaces to our group workspace available um, in the back pocket as features, which we are hoping to roll out at some point. Um, and that will aid the transition so that uh, if you have a, group, a bunch of data and you've converted one part of your workload into the object model, you can try it out through the object interface. And uh, if there's some parts which are uh, still to be converted over, you can still carry on using the POSIX interface. Okay. I think probably to summary, we will give training at some point, I would say, because that's what we generally try and do. Um, but we're not at the stage to be able to do that yet. Yeah, I mean, I think it looks like um, something that we could probably roll into the, um, the form that some of, we've got some of the other uh, exercises in the Jasmine workshop, you know, providing some examples along the lines of AG's ABC unit kind of thing. Um, but ultimately, all we can do is provide that sort of template, if you like, for, for users to take away and, and adapt for their own individual um, workflows. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to try and go through some of the ones which have come in a bit later today. So um, I'm going to guess who I think they're going to be for, but feel free to change them if not. Um, so what if I need to install a newer version of a given programming language, e.g. Octave? Ag? Um, so that really depends about the time scales. Um, if you need to install a, a language or a software package, 
and you need to use it very quickly, then your best option is to install it into your home directory and use it yourself from there. Um, if you can wait a while, then you can put a request into our help desk and say, please, can you upgrade this version of this package or these packages to these versions and please tell us which versions you need um, and then we can put that add that to our list of target target versions that we will try and build into the next version of Jaspi or the Jasmine Sci environment um, and then we will do our best to include those um, as long as we don't hit any significant problems in trying to do so. At the moment we don't have a uh, a, a regular time scale for when we make these updates. Um, I wish we did, but it's it relates to how much resource we've actually got to support our software environments. Um, but I ideally would be looking to to provide an update on a kind of three monthly time scale once we've got everything in place. Okay. Um got about 10 minutes left. Um, I know that you can all see that there are questions. I'm not sure if there's any more that you desperately want to answer now. If there's any that have caught any of your eyes, shout now. Um, if not, we can answer the rest of them offline or I can just randomly pick. <laughs> so Poppy, there are, there are three about notebooks that I okay. think I can respond to very quickly. So Okay, you go. Um, I'll have a quick go at those. So somebody has asked, can you run a Jupyter notebook in a specific environment, one created with Conda, and how would you load that environment? Um, in, in general, um, a notebook comes with a pre-configured environment. So in order to fire up the notebook, you've already, you've already activated an environment and the notebook lives inside that environment. So you, so you can't really install another environment into a, a running notebook um, the I suppose the so that that's that's one overarching point um, Jupyter notebooks as a whole um, it's really useful if they have some kind of of setup environment script and Conda is a very good way of doing that if you look at tools like binder which is a, a cloud service for defining and building Jupyter Notebook environments, um, that actually builds, it builds notebooks on the fly in the cloud in, in Docker containers, and it reads Conda environment files to, to build the um, dependencies. So that's one way you can do that if you're doing it with yourself. If you're on the Jasmine Notebook service, I'm afraid you can't provide a different environment. It is possible to install some extra packages into a virtual environment um, um, and you can see our notebook service um, repository to find out more about that. Um, another one was can users read and write to their home directories and scratch directories from the Jupyter notebooks? Um, so the home directory, yes, you have read and write access in the same way as you do in a normal SSH session. Um, in terms of the scratch directories, um, the answer is no, none of those scratch directories are made available to the Jasmine Notebook service, um, and that is intentional. Um, so typically you're only going to be writing relatively small amounts of data within a notebook. And the last question about notebooks was, is there an easy way to export a Jupyter Notebook as a Python module? Um, I've, I've done some Googling and there is a tool called NB convert. Um, so NB convert can be installed with the, the pip command. Um, so you could install this into a virtual environment um, on Jasmine. And it's a, just a command line script. You give it the notebook as input and it will write a, a Python module as the output. Okay. Like I have just spotted another notebook one, which okay. I've just copied in below. So hopefully you should be able to see that. Okay, is it possible to run a notebook in the background so you don't have to be logged into it for hours? I um, can take this, Ag. Yeah, go Matt. So the answer to that is um, because of that, so we're intending the notebook service to be used mostly for interactive things. So 
if you've got long running processing that's going to take hours to run, you should probably think about using Lotus for that. So the answer to that is no, we, we, we don't leave, you can't close your browser and have your notebook keep running in the background because what we want is for, because that's not fair to other users who want to get on and use the notebooks for interactive things. Um, if you want to use, if you want to do stuff that's long running, use Lotus. Um, the second one, is it possible to use parallel computing with a notebook with Dask? The answer to that is not on the notebook, not on the Jasmine notebook service at the moment. Um, you can use Dask with notebooks in the cluster, in the Jupyter Hub that's offered in the cluster as a service in the cloud. Um, we are also looking at ways to support Dask better, but we don't have a we don't have an integration with the notebooks yet. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's not really a question, it's just a comment from Patrick who's talking about um, the rose silk jewels stuff and it just says, the main thing needed for jewels with rose silk is MPI libraries and net CDF libraries, which have been tested. There should be further information to the jewels users list soon. Dave Case is managing this and I'll, I'll click answer live so you can see that as answered. Um, that's just more of a comment, I think. I'm happy to take the one about the data transfer. Um, yeah. Question if you like, so I've got some wider comments about that as well. Yeah, uh, go. Again, it would probably help if I um, put my slide up for this because uh, there's a few bits and pieces to show. Um, so let me just do that. Do you want me to read out the question whilst you're doing that? Uh, yeah, it was the one about WinSCP, was it? Okay, so the question is, is there a way to configure WinSCP through VPN or through an SSH tunnel when working from home using the new transfer service? Yeah. So is that showing transfer services? Yeah. Okay, so um, I think the question is, is <coughs> um, related to uh, the issue of the sort of reverse DNS lookup and all that kind of stuff that we were talking about um, in relation to the login machines. And um, we mentioned that although we can provide um, the login machines uh, with a specific configuration to allow um, from um, you know, non-institutional networks, um, it's much harder to do with the transfer machines. And in fact, um, it's not necessarily the, the right thing to do. So um, the short answer is um, we prefer you not to do some um, fancy tunneling or whatever. Um, so perhaps it's best to just look at the, the available transfer services and talk through what they do. So essentially um, we've got, oops, sorry, I'll go back a slide. Um, we've got the transfer um, virtual machines themselves. So the ones at the same level as the login machines here. So these are virtual machines. Um, they're simple, you know, they're for simple and lightweight transfers. Um, they've got a bunch of tools on them, which are, which are good for just moving, um, you know, a few files around, but nothing too heavy. In fact, those tools themselves, the SSH based uh, transfer tools are limited in their performance. They, they can't use all, even all the available bandwidth because um, of the uh, limitations of the protocol. Um, some of the tools are provided on those machines for sort of pulling things into Jasmine. So we've got WGET and LFTP, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, for pulling data into Jasmine, once you're on one of those machines, there's a few more things available. The HP Expert uh, machines, which are the ones in the data transfer zone, these are essentially the same type of machine, um, uh, the same set of tools rather, um, but they're on a physical machine, and so we're expecting higher performance from those. They're in a special zone of the network that's um, as close to, to the Janet, um, Super Janet network as we can get you on the Jasmine network. Um, so uh, ideally placed in that respect. Um, those are IP limited from outside. Um, but again, you've got the same sets of tools on those just to do the same kind of transfers, but um, a bit with a bit more grunt. Yeah. However, um, the, the third option is Globus. So this is also in the um, data transfer zone. And this is also the thing that we would recommend for people who don't have, um, who aren't able to connect using their institutional networks. It is a bit more of a learning curve to get set up with it, but we have, we have users in Oxford and we have users in New Zealand who use this. Um, and, and both are very, um, you know, they'd, they'd highly recommend it. Um, so this is a managed data transfer service. 
it's based on grid FTP under the hood. So it actually does the transfers more efficiently, uses all the available bandwidth. Um, so we've got an endpoint here at Jasmine. That's the Globus endpoint you can see here. You would need an endpoint either at your institution or you can set up your own um, Globus endpoint with a thing called Globus Connect Personal. Um, and then you can use a whole bunch of tools um, to do transfers between those two endpoints. So you can use, um, there's a, there's a web-based, um, browser-based uh, transfer tool, um, there's an API, there's a Python um, uh, layer, and there's some good examples of how to do and even automate transfers uh, using that system. And the nice thing about this is that we only need to permit uh, in our data transfer zone, the Globus IPs. Um, you can connect to anywhere from those Globus I to, to those Globus IPs, and then we already um, put those on our allow list. Um, so it makes the whole thing a lot more manageable and scalable for doing particularly bigger, larger scale data transfers and makes life easier for everybody. Great, thanks Matt. Right, we're coming very close to the end. Um, so I'm just thinking, Brian, is there anything else you want to say as Jasmine PI? <laughs> have we have we covered everything? Well, I don't know. I'm, Sorry to I bring that on. We've I've, we've I've covered had... we've covered most of the questions, but is there anything else you want to add based on what we've been discussing? No, I don't think so. No, fab. All right. just, well, perhaps I'd just say that that clearly we're trying to transition um, towards new technologies, but some of the technologies you're very familiar with will be around for decades to come. It's a bit like Fortran. Many of you will uh, will say that Fortran's useless, um, and you'll be right. But there's still lots of people using Fortran, and I think POSIX will be in the same boat. So um, for many of you, POSIX will be you'll retire with it, I'm sure. But for others of you, object stores will become really important, and that's both both for both communities. That's fine. Great, thanks, Brian. Right, Matt. I think you've got some wrap up slides, and then hopefully we'll be done on time for everyone.